This paper aims to trace the creative evolution of Epithalamion, from its genesis as a film score in 1962 through to its final version from around 1968, making it one of the last orchestral pieces on which Gerard would have worked. It sits alongside two other compositions left incomplete in 1968, Metamorphoses, the reworking of the Second Symphony, and the Fifth Symphony. I am going to begin by exploring its origins through the film score of this sporting life and how this music is incorporated into the concert work. I will investigate the revisions made by Gerard and end with exploring the final published version of the work. It is interesting that at the point of considering Gerard as a composer for this sporting life, the director, Lindsay Anderson, claims to have known almost nothing of his music except his contribution to secret people. He went on to say, But I knew his style was not sentimentally melodic, while I also knew, if only by intuition, that he had a powerfully romantic sensibility. The music for Secret People indeed demonstrates romantic sensibility, but, in contradiction to Anderson, also provides sentimental melody. Anderson himself described the adapted folk tune used in the score as a beautiful, broad and romantic melody which is arranged by Roberto served its purpose very well. This seems very distant from the music which Anderson seemed to desire for this sporting life. In his initial correspondence, Anderson suggests that the early part of the film is constructed with flashbacks where music or non-naturalistic sound can probably play a useful part. Indeed, Anderson discusses vis visiting Gerard, talking about the score, and even assisting him in throwing various objects down the stairs in an effort to produce the right kind of abstract sounds which he felt he needed. Though Anderson adds to this that he was unable to really appreciate the full effect until the recording session with orchestra. It was during the process of combining the music and film together that Anderson began to have some reservations. He said, For the big, violently emotional confrontation of the two principal characters, Roberta had written a violent, jaggedly emotional music. This seemed simply to duplicate the dramatic action, and we dropped it. But given Anderson did not want the sentimentally melodic, arguably supported by the comment above, and was aware of the abstract sounds Gerard was conceiving, it is possible to imagine how Gerard may have felt with respect to the opening titles, with which Anderson was unhappy, as can be read on the slide. Anderson's solution to the opening titles was to create a montage of other musical cues, which he linked together with the noise of the rugby spectators cheering. Anderson believed this worked extremely well, although of course it made Roberto very angry. I think he refused to come and see the film in London, but later, when we were in communication again, he told me that he'd seen it in Cambridge and had been furious. According to Gerard's original list of cues for this sporting life, which is in the Cambridge Archive, there are 46 cues totalling just over 32 minutes of music. The film itself is 2 hours 14 minutes long. 15 cues, just over 8 minutes of music, are as Gerard had originally intended it. In other words, the visual cue listed in his notes matches the musical cue. A further 16 are to some extent adapted in the following ways. Using the intended material with some small changes, for example cutting bars. Some small semblance to Gerard's intended material but other material added. And using different music generally from another cue. There are four non-listed cues which utilise music from elsewhere in the film. There is a total of 15 cues where the intended music is not employed. From the original 32 minutes of music, around 19 minutes is actually used, and out of the 46 original cues, 24 are employed. The contentious opening titles begin with Gerard's intended cue using the first 22 seconds, until the tempo changed to energetic. At this point, the music becomes more jagged in nature, and Anderson edits in a cue from later in the film, which segues into crowd noise at 34 seconds. It is after 19 seconds of this, merely accompanying the titles, that a further cue from later in the film is employed, featuring violins and flute, ending just before the first scene of the film, where the rugby ball comes into sight.
As a comparison to Anderson's alternative opening, the following example is a reconstruction of what the film may have looked like had Gerard's intentions come to fruition. This music is from a 2002 NMC recording where David Matthews has organised the most substantial sections of the score into an eight-movement suite, which incorporates about two-thirds of the total music composed. Please excuse the audio as I have had to alter some of the time lengths in order to make it fit the cue properly. Some of the tempi were not observed as accurately as they would have been in the studio recording for film. The music of this sporting life is 12 tone, and Gerard uses a row consisting of two 6 1 hexachords. In normal order, these of course spell out a chromatic scale, and are the same as used in his fourth symphony. This is an uncharacteristic row within Gerard's symphonic canon, as to this point he is preferred to use rows where the two hexachords are unrelated. Unusually for this period in Gerard's output, there is evidence of some semblance of melodic thematicism in this sporting life, one of a number of musical acknowledgements that composing for film necessitates different approaches to writing for the concert hall. A striking feature of the opening timpani, piano and accordion is the descending minor ninth, which introduces the first three notes of PA naught, G, F sharp and D sharp. There are similarities in the nature of this material, and its continued thematic usage to that of the concerto for orchestra, where Gerard uses pitch materials in certain shapes to create textual features, often prioritising the pitch order of the first hexachord of the row in order to achieve this. You will see its thematic usage in a number of examples I will share. A second thematic idea which is prominent across cues is a distinctive ascending scalic melody in 1M3 in the strings which returns in spirit in 2M7, and again in 5M1 in the clarinet and viola where it outlines a whole tone scale. A further thematic example illustrates Gerard's liberal use of the tone row in his work. There is a chromatic clarinet solo in 5M1 which outlines the mostly non-complementary hexachords in the example, and leads eventually to a non-serial arpeggiated line. This freedom is further exploited at the end of this cue with a climactic C major chord which gradually becomes dissonant. This coincides with the moment in the film where Frank is recruited to the professional rugby club and he is looking at his cheque for £1,000 which fades out to him coming around in the dentist's chair. This chromatic usage is similar to that used in 13M2 for flute trio which has similar ambiguities in its serial usage. 
Another technique which features in the symphonies appears merely once in this sporting life, chord rotation. Its employment is particularly similar to the quasi-canonic techniques applied to chord rotation in the first symphony and in particular the third symphony. In this sporting life the chord rotation can be found in Q11ME in the lower strings. The first vertical outlines PB5. Then its complementary hex chord is presented horizontally with the pitch classes 0, 9, 10, 7, 8, 11, indicated in bold on the slide, starting in the base of the second chord, which is the vertical of PB4 at this point. Once the end of PA5 is reached, pitch class 11, PB5 begins, outlining 6, 5, 2, 3, 4. The final pitch having been presented at the start of the rotation, pitch class 1. It can be seen that this is used canonically in each of the parts, ending in the last six notes of the top line. This results in the pitches of the original chord being rotated, indicated by the arrows, except for the one new pitch which is introduced each time in the bass. The nature of film music, the often fractured nature of the cues, and the fact that the music is governed by the filmic narrative is such that some of the macrocosmic structural devices which Gerard had been experimenting with to this point in his life might have proven challenging. It is unlikely, for example, that he ever considered using any sort of proportions derived from the tone row for organisational purposes in this work. However, there is some evidence of the use of transpositional ordering derived from an acrostic arrangement of the tone row, which results in the sequence on this slide. This ordering can be found in the highlighted cues. None of these cues are used in the complete form, and the latter two are not used at all in the film. Having explored this sporting life, we can now start considering its transformation into epithalamium. It was clear that the relationship between Lindsay Anderson and Gerard was problematic. Anderson describes Gerard as hot-tempered and self-willed, and not a natural collaborator. But interestingly, after this sporting life, Anderson contacted Gerard with a new proposal. I am hoping next year to do a production on Hamlet in Warsaw. Do you remember me getting very excited when you played me the tape of your symphonic piece for orchestra and sounds, and mentioned then, I think, that it put Hamlet into mind? I am wondering if you would consider allowing me to use it for this Polish enterprise. Through this series of correspondence, he refers back to the experiences of the production of this sporting life. It is difficult to discern whether this letter of August 1965 was the lighting of the touch paper for Epithalamion. Could it be that the memories of the ordeal of the collaboration flooded back to Gerard and he had a desire to make right the castration of the original by creating a new absolute piece with some resolve? We do know that the work took some years and a couple of performances before reaching its final form, and uncharacteristically there are traces of this evolution in the archive which permits a new level of scrutiny of Gerard's creative process. There are essentially two different scores in the archive of the University of Cambridge, 5.01 and 3.02. 5.01 is dated 1965, 3.02 is dated 1965-66. The front page of the latter gives us a more specific date range of November 1965 to January 1966. However, there is evidence that editing continued beyond this date, as Oms recalls Gerard writing to him in February 1966, telling him of his urgent work on an orchestral piece called Epithalamion. Epithalamion is a song or a poem celebrating a wedding. It is taken from the Greek epi, meaning upon, and thalamio, translated as bride chamber. This provides the context for the inscription under the title of 5.01, meaning in honour of the groom and the bride. As can be seen, Gerard's eponymic inscription has been painted over with correction fluid in 3.02. In the Teatro La Fenice archive, where the work was first performed as part of the Marzotto Prize concert, it is listed as both title and inscription. This perhaps suggests that it was the slightly earlier of the two manuscripts, 5.01, which was submitted to the prize and first performed on the 17th of September 1966. The musical revisions between these two manuscripts are evident from the outset. In 5.01, the first two pictures of the opening timpani motive, 
G and F sharp are sustained by the double basses. In 3.02, the third pitch, which completes the motive, E flat, is also doubled in the double bass, but the upper strings, which enter at this point in 5.01, are omitted. This is clearly evident in 3.02, with correction fluid being used quite generously over these bars. As can be seen, these subtle changes place 3.02 closer to the final published score than 5.01. There are significant structural differences between 5.01 and 3.02. The 5.01 score ends on page 82. 3.02 ends on page 90, but is followed by eight more pages which are labelled as pages 75 to 82. The first and last of these are emphatically hatched through in black felt tip. These additional pages are exactly the same as the final eight pages of 5.01. So between these two versions, Gerard changed the ending. It is likely that the score 3.02 was that used for the British performance at the Cheltenham Festival on 12th of July 1968. However, it is impossible to ascertain whether the hatched out pages were part of this performance or the newly inserted pages. During the rehearsals leading to this, a number of notes were made with respect to revisions and performance directions. The archival notebook 10.105 refers to a number of corrections which do not appear in 3.02 but appear in the final OUP score and this includes quite a considerable structural change. It is particularly interesting in that the date of the top of page 5 of this notebook is 13th of July 1968 which is the day after the actual Cheltenham concert and therefore a number of these amendments are unlikely to have appeared in the British premiere. The section being referred to here on page 14 of the notebook is that based on Q6M1 of This Sporting Life and it is moved wholesale from its original position to before the piano cadenza or bar 234 in the final OUP score. This significantly alters the original structural form of the composition but interestingly it actually seems to make more sense in the way it maps onto the transpositional orderings. The process of final publication was clearly drawn out. The first copies of a score being hired and employed in Italy was in 1966, yet a final version of Epithalamion was not published until 1968, and it is likely that this version was not actually performed until after Gerard's death at the prom in 1970. The opening of Epithalamion instantly harks to that of this sporting life, with the already mentioned distinctive timpani descending G to F sharp and descending E flat. The first 13 bars of the cue of this sporting life, all that was used in the film, is expanded in epithalamion. It is interesting to note that despite the opening bars of each giving the illusion of deriving from exactly the same material, the tone rows are, in fact, subtly but significantly different. As the hexachords remain intact, this has little, if any, impact on the use of the tone row on a micro level. However, as transpositional ordering is carried over from the early work, the acrostic of these transpositions is different. More on this later. Of the cues originally written for Ger by Gerard for this sporting life, about 15 are incorporated into Epithalamion. Seven were employed in the film, and therefore the other eight did not make it to the final cut. The most extensive borrowing from this sporting life is from cues 1M1 and 6M1, with around 45 bars of the 68 of the former and 35 bars from 50 of the latter being incorporated into the new work. It is indeed these two cues which are quoted directly in terms of both their melodic and harmonic material, albeit often extended and developed. A lesser example is that of the ascending melodic material I mentioned earlier with reference to 5M1. In Epithalamion, this becomes a sweeping ascending line outlining the whole tone scale spread over three bars, rising up from the horns into the woodwind. Other cues, where the materials clearly influence Epithalamion without direct appropriation, use textual or tonal features as a starting point. For instance, the flute trio in the cue 13M2 is employed in Epithalamion. Similarly, the tonal qualities of the flute, which feature strongly in this sporting life, are carried into Empathalamian in the flute cadenza. This begins with PA naught and the distinctive opening descending minor ninth, G to F sharp, followed by further descent to a D sharp or minor tenth below. 
The jagged leaps, which are such a feature, are obviously connected with 6M1, already discussed, but also recalls the flute solo of 3M2. Textual influence can be seen in the self-harmonising melody in the strings at bar 224, which is reminiscent, reminiscent of that in 4M1. That epithalamion differs in musical function to this sporting life will naturally result in different structures and compositional techniques being used to present its, its materials. There are certain devices which Gerard employs in his absolute music which would have been difficult to incorporate into a film score. Time lattice would do little to drive a narrative forward in the medium from film. However, it was an important feature in the works from the Third Symphony going forward and unsurprisingly it features in epithalamion. A second structural feature of epithalamion evolves from this sporting life and is a quasi concertante orchestration where certain solar instruments or instrumental groups are brought to the fore. These are particularly emphasised in the cadenzas, one each for piano and flute and two for percussion. A third structural device used in epithalamion is the regular appearance of 12 note chords through the work. There seem to be 11 such chords or almost 12 note chords. The first of these is at bar 23 and on this occasion there is no G, though this pitch does appear in the percussion chord directly before it. This is a new structural design not used in this sporting life, as can be seen from the equivalent point in 1M1. However, a 12-note harmony does appear at the start of cue 14M8 plus 9, but this has no thematic significance in the film score. The use of transpositional ordering has been discussed with respect to this sporting life, where some small indicators of this practice can be identified. In epithalamion, this seems to be used more extensively. The acrostic order is slightly different to that of the film score, owing to the difference in the tone rows. This is by no means a duplication of the technique found in the second symphony, where the order is quite strictly adhered to, and the length of each transposition covered by a time row. However, the question as to whether other temporal devices are used must be asked. The use of the tone row for structural purposes is well documented. In functions of the series in 12-note composition, Gerard introduces a new notion which he calls a time aggregate. Needless to say, given all the revisions of the musical materials discussed in this paper, finding evidence of such a time aggregate governing in a strict sense is going to be challenging. The use of the time aggregate to govern proportions of the music of this sporting life would be problematic given the need to fit to the timings of the film cues. Therefore, any sections of music reimagined from this score are potentially not going to fit a new scheme, unless engineered to do so. The most useful starting point to explore whether Gerard in fact used this technique as a scaffold within which the materials from this sporting life were reconstructed would be the original draft 5.01. However, even with this there are complexities. For example, Gerard's own bar numbering is skewed from bar 20 onwards, so is it safe to assume that any possible time aggregate calculations are also awry? This is assuming Gerard is potentially applying the proportions to the metrical discourse of the music rather than the timings. Both have their problems as will be discerned. In which case, problems arise in the freedom of the cadenzas, often senza misura, with fermata over empty bars and elements of temporal indeterminacy where length is indicated approximately. Ultimately, this original draft, taking into account amendments, is 515 bars, which is incidentally the same as the published version. 5.01 shows more evidence of following the time aggregate in that these 515 bars, in the largest application of the proportion, are split into 337 and 178. Bar 337 marks the new tutti section after the flute cadenza with a metrical change to 6-8 and a tempo change to Vivace. Other key areas which seem to be defined by the proportion are the con motto at bar 234, the piano cadenza at bar 287 and some other sectional tempo changes. As already discussed, the published score has significant changes where large sets of that sections have been moved compared with the original version, which have any impact on initial structures that have been put in place. There are some sections which may seem to align with the primary proportions, again sectional tempo changes, but I would be reluctant to claim that Gerard was attempting to metamorphose his additions into the original design. To conclude, 
The evolution of epithalamine from this sporting life is an interesting phenomenon in Gerard's output. It gives us a unique viewpoint into Gerard's creative process, which arguably no other works provide. We have the origins of the work from 1962, if we consider the original suggestion from Anderson to Gerard to write the score. This, of course, sits in the period between the Third Symphony and Concerto for Orchestra. It is of little surprise, therefore, that this work is compositionally closer to these works. The self-harmonising melodies and chord rotation, closer to the Third Symphony, the almost thematic treatment of the tone rose motivic characteristics treated in a comparable way to the concerto. However, in a similar way that Metamorphoses reveals a reimagination of the Second Symphony through the experience of the works composed during the period of regestation, Epithalamine reworks the materials of this sporting life such that they are creatively closer in relationship to the Fourth Symphony. And finally, my eponymous intrigue. Given this is a celebration of a wedding, I'm yet to discover who was actually married.